there's the camera. Here I am, Walter Bosley, live on the Walter Bosley channel. And tonight we have another great episode of California with Todd Wood. And he's got special guests. Okay. Amy Iconospastic. Now she's got her own uh, channel you guys are going to learn about. Um, so uh, uh, we're, we've also got William Ramsey. So uh, in a moment here, I'll bring them on and, and we'll get started. But uh, I wanted to, let me see, is there any anything I need to tell you guys about? Hold on a second. I got my phone cord getting in my way here, but that's okay. Once again, I think I told you guys, but my Napoleon article is out in the new, just released issue of World Explorer magazine. See that on the cover, Napoleon and the Great Pyramid. Yes, sirree. This is my third time being published in this magazine, and um, it's it looks like a really great issue. I haven't read it yet myself. Azadlan and the Grand Canyon, the mysteries of early Korea, the mystery of the megalithic jars, and my Napoleon article. So. You can find this in Barnes & Noble on the magazine rack, or, as you should do, go to adventuresunlimitedpress.com and become a member, a subscriber, and you'll get the magazine, you'll get discounts, you'll get the catalog, just all sorts of good stuff. So um, go check out the WEX Club, World Explorer Club, at adventuresunlimitedpress.com. Get your hands on that magazine with my article on it. So I want to welcome everyone here tonight um, for another episode of California, as I said. And uh, we have some folks in the live chat already. Tim Houston. Welcome, Tim. D. Dorothy Papineau. Johnny Sides here. Matthew Burns. And... Rodney Stubbert, Jay Grinder, R.E. Bavel, hello R.E., Paul the First, or Paul I, Crystal Fire, okay, Oregon Music Fan is here, so as people pile in, uh, we're going to proceed with tonight's show. Now, uh, everyone here is familiar with The Doors, okay? Um, even if you're not a gray beard in my generation, you're familiar with the doors and they're, I think really great, you know, rock music that rock and roll music them kids are listening to. And, uh, of course you've heard of Aleister Crowley, particularly if you've, you know, watched this channel. Um, and so tonight we're going to discuss on California the possibility that uh, Jim Morrison may have been a follower or devotee of Aleister Crowley and the doors included. And uh, we're going to be getting into some other weird things in the Laurel Canyon music scene, um, which also means this book here will come up, Dave McGowan's Weird Scenes in the Canyon. You got to read this book. This, this is full of some amazing information, which we will be getting into. So without further ado, let us bring in our guests, Todd Wood and Amy Iconospastic. Welcome. How you doing, guys? <laughs> so glad to be back. Got Amy in the house. Hello. Got William Amy in the house. Yeah, this is Amy's first time here, so uh, she'll she'll. Uh, I'm sure you've watched before, but now you're here, you get to be part of the the weird nerdiness that is California on the Walter Bosley Channel. And now we have William Ramsey. Welcome, William. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. What's up, William? So, hey, Todd. How are you? Good. Let me uh, get over here, because as we know, the live chat knows that I do not pay attention to the live chat while we're talking. So, folks, um, 
This is an interesting, very interesting topic tonight. So Todd, I'm going to let you jump in and uh, start us off. Well, we thought this was blah, 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 blah. we thought this would be a good topic to start with. Um, just to, sort of an introduction into the whole weird scenes inside Laurel Canyon milieu. Um, and for people who aren't like familiar with that, is a book written by Dave McAllen, and the synopsis of this book is that the legitimate anti-war movement was sort of co-opted by the hippie movement. And that a lot of the bands that you believed uh, were sort of sprung up in Laurel Canyon, such as the Mamas and the Papas and the Doors and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and what have you, you believe that they, they popped up organically, but the right. truth is much more sinister that maybe the whole thing was orchestrated as a huge psyop. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the doors is a great introduction to this whole thing. In my yes. opinion, would you say Walter? Uh, yeah. I mean that whole bit about, uh, you know, the, the, their, their, their songs that we're all familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. most of them, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was all of them, but most of them might've been all of them were pre-written, um, before the band even formed, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Uh, right, Morrison. Right. Well, now I, I do want to say this though. Um, I, Morrison, he was a poet, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder if when he used the word songs, he was referring specifically to just the lyrics and then they did the music afterwards. But there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, you know, the music uh, to some degree had been composed for them as well. Correct? Yes. 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 In fact, I'm going to I'm going to pass it over to Amy and she she can start talking about um, Jim Morrison, the doors in, in Laurel Canyon. Excuse me, Todd, if you could do one thing, aim your sure. camera down a little bit because we're basically getting the tops. There we go. Now we can see. That. Okay. <laughs> People got, they got a good look at my bald spot. That's important. That's important. My, my retreating hairline. See, what happens is I look in the mirror and yeah. then I hear these little screams and hair follicles just fall off. It's like they're committing suicide. It's, 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 it's character impressive. building, Todd. It's character okay. building. It is. Go ahead. Proceed. I'm sorry. What was, what was the uh, question? Can, you, can, can you introduce us to the doors in Laurel Canyon? Like, when did they um, when did they form? Um, and how how did they meet? How did Jim Morrison uh, meet the rest of the members or meet uh, film, the, school. Film, film school at UCLA? Mm -hmm. Well, they want to make it seem like they met on a beach, but that's probably bullshit. Are we allowed to swear on the stream? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, I just want to make sure because I have a potty mouth. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was 1965, wasn't it? Yeah, I think 1965 on the beach, he met like his keyboard player. The, the organist. Uh, let me. Ray, Ray Manzarek. Manzarek. Zan Ray yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, the interesting, an interesting factoid as a side note to uh, meeting at the UCLA Film School, because it, Everybody, I don't want anybody to be disappointed that we didn't at least mention some serial killers. The serial killer Rodney Alcala attended that same film school in 1968, as yeah. well as Luis uh, Gonzalez, another killer that may have MK Ultra ties, killed his girlfriend um, that same and mutilated her body that same year. He killed her to unleash his mother's spirit from his I girlfriend. have a question. Um, I, I didn't know that about. Rodney Alcala, and now that I find out he went to UCLA Film School, how did he not get work as an executive in the motion picture industry? I don't know. That's really interesting, considering his uncle, uh, Bobby Bukur Alcala, uh, who died. That, that on the was a that was a joke, Todd. Oh, oh, well, being that I, he's being he's that he's a murderer and a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> Never yeah. mind. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I got you. I got you. But you know, people didn't know that in '68. So. Okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, you want to continue? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, well, I mean, he wasn't, I mean, Jim Morrison wasn't um, even a musician or a singer or anything. 
Right. He just was a poet. That was it. <laughs> and they were like recruited him. I mean, I, what, I wasn't wasn't it wasn't it also that uh, Manzarek asked him, "Can you sing?" And he said, "Fuck no." <laughs> but it was like, "Let's do it." Right. Anyway. Yeah, that's that's I think that's right. And you know, the funny thing is that movie makes you want to think that it's like um, they met on the beach, and you know, uh, Zan Eric, uh, Zan Eric, or one is Manzarek. I think it's Manzarek. 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 Thank you, William. And um, that is such a cringeworthy part of that movie. I mean, oh my God. Uh, I could hardly stand it. It's exactly like the movie Step Brothers when John C. Riley wanted uh, Will Ferrell to start singing. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. It's it's utterly cringeworthy. And it, that, there's a lot about the Doors movie that um, the audience will find out in the, the uh, as this conversation progresses. Yes. That is inaccurate and incorrect oh yeah yeah the movie stone took dramatic liberties big time he so sure did continue though i i won't interrupt anymore he with did. humor you know that's what hollywood does yeah mm -hmm. now so, uh, what's interesting about morrison and the secret kind of background is his dad was the guy involved in the gulf of tonkin incident in 1964 right. who was like a high level naval Commander or something, mm -hmm. but the whole was, of Tom, the Gulf of Tonkin, the Golden Tonkin never admiral. happened. It never happened. Like there yeah. was, it was all fiction. Like there was no, there wasn't even an encounter with the boat. They made everything. not only that. At, the, at this point in our history, the government are openly saying that it, it never happened, and that the whole thing was basically a false flag of some sort. I mean, they I'm, not, I'm saying that they just made up. What I'm saying, Todd, is that they just made everything up. Like there was yeah. actually no even false flag. They just said yeah, we were attacked. That's the wrong that term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess they learned their lesson about, you know, um, with the uh, USS Maine and the um, Spanish-American War. Why spend even money on the explosives? Just lie right. about it, right? Right. Good right, good right. Point. And good. it's interesting. There's actually a picture of Jim Morrison on the um, the ship. What's the name of the ship again? I. You know, that picture's out there. There is a picture of him. I've seen it. Yeah. Yes, with his dad. Yeah, it's in it's in the uh the McGowan book here. Here it is, right here. I got it. It is the, the oh my gosh. I should have known this. It's the USS Bonon Richard. I, I am a huge um oh my god. I'm a huge fan of his, but I can't think of his name. John Paul Jones. Um, I'm a huge fan of John Paul Jones, the, the naval officer, not the drummer. Um, so yeah, that picture was on the Bonhomme Richard, uh, in January of 1964. So, there you go. and I think the Gulf of Tonkin was August, 1964. So he's on there the same year. This whole thing that right. started off a disastrous war, like just a. Right, right. I mean, thousands and thousands of people got murdered in that war. In the Vietnam War, was it fifty thousand Americans? But we killed three million people there, all through yeah. Southeast Asia. So it was really a disaster for them. And it is interesting because Jim Morrison is on that bridge just two months or two months after JFK gets assassinated, right? Yeah, and then yeah, the yeah, yeah. Tonkin happens almost within the year, like this. Right, and then the next year the is when the the doors uh, form in nineteen sixty five. Wow. Wow, it's incredible. you know what's interesting though. Um, the issue I have with the photo is I don't know if that date is correct because look how young Morrison looks there in '64. And when did the uh, when did the doors emerge at the whiskey in '67? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they and funny enough, uh, Amy, you want to tell them how who owned the whiskey a go go and how they got booked and uh, uh, Jim, a bit of Jim Morrison's background, like who we went to school with and. Like preschool? It's um it's uh what's his name? Um Elmer Valentine owned the whiskey go go. Yeah, he's he's this disgraced corrupt cop out of uh Chicago. And interestingly enough, the person booking the shows at the Whiskey A Go Go was Gail Zappa. And okay. the, the thing about Gail Zappa is she went to preschool with Jim Morrison in Virginia right. and her parents 
were also part of the military industrial complex. Well, th that that was a big thing when I read uh, McGowan's book. How many of these big stars, David Crosby was one of them, Zappa is another one. I mean, you name it, so many of them were the children of um, U.S. military officers, specifically intelligence officers in many cases. And I mean, come on, do the math on that. It, it, the book has a lot more details um, on that. But yeah, that's so it, it really shouldn't be a surprise that, um, you know, that it's been suspected, put out there that there was some type of psyop involved in the Laurel Canyon music scene, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me one bit. I mean, just look at like Steven Stills. We have to ask ourselves, like, what was he doing in El Salvador? Right? He, the, the guy was obviously doing some sort of like intelligent work. Intelligent which work. which one was it? Was it Steven Stills? Who was it that said that they were doing that kind of stuff? Oh, in, I don't um, know. One of them in the book, McGowan, if I'm not mistaken, it's in the McGowan book, says that he was in Vietnam or, or gosh, I, I, I can't think. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, another interesting little factoid about Jim Morrison is that mm -hmm. he actually went to the same Alexandria, Virginia high school as um, Mama Cass Elliott and um, John Phillips, mm -hmm. who we'll wow. discuss in a later show. And the, yeah. their potential connection, of course, to Manson and the process Church of the Final Judgment. Um, the, the the real question here is, when did Jim Morrison go dark? As you know, when did he start getting into Crowley? When when did the um, the train get off the tracks, so to speak? Or maybe as a poet, maybe he was always into um, Jim Morrison. I bet William has a lot. Are, are always into Aleister Crowley. I bet William has has something to say about that. Well, I definitely have that picture you can show of him with the bust with the pyramidal hand mm -hmm. hand gesture. You just have to click it in there, um, Walter. If you can see that on your side, you just have to add uh, it to the show. So he's definitely has a bust of Crowley. I think that he was always um, kind of into the dark sided stuff. So mm -hmm. I think that that's it. I could never. In my overview of him, I couldn't trace a lot of stuff. I know about his witch wife, and right. his witch wife is actually in the blood seeking uh, drinking scene in mm -hmm. the Doors film by Oliver Stone. So right, the and uh, uh, the the wife herself is also in the um, the wedding scene. She's right. like the high priestess in the, the, yes, the wedding. Keneally is the um, most high priest. I have to I have to interject something here about the photo of the bust, um, the one where um, yeah. he's sitting there with the bust in front of him, and his hands are like this. Morrison, can't you just draw that up, Walter? Just just take your mouse over it and say add to the show. It'll pop in. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. It's not okay, doing that. Um, yeah. Um, here's the thing. I looked into that photo. Uh, as you can see, it, the way it's cropped, you the rest of the band is not in the photo with him. But what it was was a photo taken um, because they needed a promotional photo for their a live album. OK. Oh. And what that bust is, is actually um, a messed up, screwed up, broken, half broken bust of Ludwig von Beethoven. Oh, interesting. That's not Aleister Crowley. It's Beethoven. Yeah, I was, and, I was um, always told that was Crowley. I uh, when I did when I looked it up, um, I saw other people said, "Oh, wait, isn't that Aleister Crowley?" And um, the source I saw that piped in was um, somebody who had been one of the roadies, and oh. another person who had had a couple of people who have the album that has the photo on it. And um, anyway, multiple sources say that that's actually Ludwig von Beethoven. Good to know. Yeah. Good Is Beethoven know. a Mason by any chance? Oh. I think he had some kind of Illuminati connection, like his gravestone right? was full of symbolism. Yeah, because I mean, Mozart was apparently Mozart was a Mason. And that makes sense. Right. Because, like, right. They probably yeah. infiltrated all of masonry. So that would make sense. The, ma the magic flute was. Fully Masonic. It was a totally Masonic. Uh, Big time. That's what's famously Masonic with uh, Mozart. Beethoven might have been. I mean, you know, back then, 
um, with the it Illuminati wasn't. having emerged in 1776, you know. But yeah, so can he, and he was always, uh, there were other instances of, of Morrison partaking in blood drinking like Crowley did. So there's other stories. There's multiple stories of him drinking blood. Whoa. Tell us about yeah. those. Well, there's one there's, uh, in my, from my book, children of the beast, it is mm -hmm. groupie Pamela day bar. She was kind of a famous kind of rock groupie. She mm -hmm. said that while Morrison was staying at the Chateau Marmont, which is a kind of an infamous hotel in LA, mm -hmm. he spent a few wild nights with a bux buxom neighbor, instigating three ways and once waking up in a tangle of bloody sheets, sheets after they shared champagne glasses of each other's blood. Right, right. Now, uh, his wife, um, Patricia. Now, the interesting thing is, like, the one thing that the movie got wrong is she was not a Wiccan. She was not part of the Wiccan religion. She was actually a Celtic pagan. And um, anybody who's wondering, who's, like, who's really deep into this subject, I will be pulling the thread and looking in to see if she has any ties to Greenfield Ranch, which you know also Leonard Lake is connected to Greenfield Ranch, and the, um, the Society for Creative Anachronism, which highly promotes uh, intellectual pedophilia and pedophilia just in general. Um, and, the, of course, the Church of All Worlds, which is at Greenfield Ranch. Um, so I will be pulling that thread, if anybody is wondering. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, Pamela DeBar, she, uh, legendary uh, groupie from that era. She's, I think she's the most famous of, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. of, of yeah. the groupies back then. And um, I looked at her, the one book she has where there's a chapter – on Morrison. And, um, of course, um, McGowan quotes the comment that, you know, about how much of a voracious reader he was and, and the quote about, well, he read a lot about, um, uh, what was it? Incest and Satanism. Um, that didn't seem as incendiary to me because I mean, my gosh, if, if, if we were all guilty of the things we read about all three of us would be in trouble <laughs> yeah probably you know? no right i mean uh, no but uh i'm i'm looking forward to reading your book william um well the pamela's book by the way is called rock bottom dark moments in music babylon that's where i got that from. okay okay do so. um uh uh that's probably her most interesting book i would venture to say yeah she's an interesting character i mean she was definitely around she bounced around um okay the other thing about like uh the morrison is he references blood drinking as kind of a magical ritual in the song peace frog so mm -hmm. they um i think it is blood screams the pain as they chop off her fingers blood will be born in the birth of a nation blood is the rose of mysterious union so that's like classic you know fusing together of union through blood that's uh he's definitely re okay. referencing you're talking about frog? Or witchcraft. Peace Frog, the song, the song I showed you. Well, that makes sense because Crowley wrote that play about the frogs where he crucifies a frog, right? Right, right. They sacrifice a frog. So yeah, in the name sense. of Jesus. The frog represents Jesus, right? Yeah, and then frogs are like the um, the food of uh, snakes. And, you know, the devil is a, a serpent. So that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that ritual is called Cross of a Frog. Oh, okay. okay, so we can right there <clears throat> our, our Morrison references to to things very specific things that Crowley wrote about. So yeah. clearly he was a reader of Crowley, a, you know, mm -hmm. a scholar of uh, Crowley's writings. Um, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. that's an interesting. He also had kind of he also you can see the shamanic nation nature of like you talk about original celtic but morrison was interested in shamanism he reenacted shamanism he had some kind of connection to indigenous kind of people in the united states mm -hmm. and so that kind of flows through a lot of his music and outlook like he was definitely trying to get into trance states during those uh, live performances right 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 um you know, the interesting thing, uh, just to take it back for a second, is that um, 
according to um, Paul Rothschild, the producer of The Doors, for most, I guess it was, was it most of their records? Um, that they, they could not, like the, mus the musicians in the band, they could not play their instruments. <laughs> Wow. Okay, I had always heard that, though. Like, they're too either too drunk or too high or too. too oh, whatever. okay. May, yeah. Maybe maybe because of that. But my understanding was that, that Manzarek has always been a musician, the keyboardist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Dinsmore, he was the bassist, right? No, that Dinsmore is the guitar player, I believe. No, Dinsmore played drums. Drums. Krieger drums. played guitar. Krieger. Manzarek yeah. was the keyboard. Keyboards, yeah. yeah. Um, Krieger, uh, Krieger was a musician, but he wasn't known to have been on the music scene, right? It was like, okay, where'd he come from then? <laughs> right. You know? Um, but, uh, at, at least I can't speak to Dinsmore and Krieger, but my understanding is, is that Manzarek was, yeah. you know, a decent, decent musician, but, um, it wouldn't surprise me yeah. because I mean, how many times was Morrison, did they have to jam for long periods of time because Morrison was inebriated and unable right, to right. Uh, perform, right? Uh, right, right. So. I, I don't know if uh, Paul Rothschild was just referring to like the studio situation because he is the producer. Yeah. That's oh, what well, I thought maybe I, like they're just too high, too drunk. Well, you know. I mean, think of, you know, uh, how many bands did the Wrecking Crew actually do the recordings? You know, they're yeah. the ones performing on the albums. We know that. There's been a lot of documentaries and books written about that. So that wouldn't. That wouldn't surprise me at all. But what interests me in this is uh, going. Let's go back to um, Morrison has written, you know, all these songs, at least the lyrics. Um, yeah. They are they are they emerge on the scene. Oh, here's band called the Doors. They emerge on the scene, um, and there was something pointed out that I was reading that. Um, how they but someone pointed out that uh, they maintained their lineup through their whole history which if you look at the other bands that changed a lot but right. the doors always you know were those four guys mm -hmm. um and so in the milieu of all these performers who, who were the kids of military intelligence um guys uh what would you say was their intended contribution in a psyop. Mm. Well, the, the whole hippie thing, right? The whole hippie thing is about mm -hmm. sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's all about self-indulgence yeah. compared to like the anti-war movement was uh, wagging their finger at the Vietnam war. Right. So they, they, yeah. the government, the psyop is they turn the, the scales. They, they, you know, uh, they turn the tables on the counterculture, mm -hmm. right. And culture is downstream from politics. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, and just the fact that some of these bands, like it took no time at all. Magazines started talking about them. And then you have the whole thing. Like, even if it's the doors first band, our first show, um, you know, you still had Vito and the freaks coming mm -hmm. in, in yeah. playing, right. and right. dancing. And, and yeah. because there's all these girls dancing, now you got guys coming in to dance with the girls. Right. Yeah. So that's like an instant crowd. Well, when you, when you uh, now jumping back over to the Crowley connection and, and William, mm -hmm. you, you might know this or have some input on this. Um, I, I'm curious who might have introduced say Morrison to Crowley and others to this stuff w within a context of a psyop, because I think of, um, Sidney Gottlieb of the CIA MK ultra program, the, the, the guy who was into all this occult stuff. And if CIA and the MK ultra guys had anything to do with this psyop, um, I could see Gottlieb being the one wanting to inject Crowleyism into all this. What do you guys think about that? I think they were new. They were change agents. I think the doors knew it. I think that the Beatles knew mm -hmm. it. I think the Rolling Stones knew it. So who's behind these guys? There's all kinds of weird stuff with the dead too. Like they're attached to like uh, Intel. So whether mm -hmm. there's an Intel, like some of this, I think I've heard arguments that a lot of the Beatles music was not written by them. 
Mm -hmm. And those are mm -hmm. all probably sealed up by like agreements or contracts or things like that. So whether the doors have had that had been to them is a good question. But I can read you a quote from mm -hmm. Manzarek that is, I think is very telling in a lot of ways because it, in, it includes a lot of kind of change issues like uh, what do you call it? it? It would be like full on thousand year change, you know, aeonic change. This is what he said about it. This is a quote from one of his books. The reason for the doors, the raison d'etre for the doors was making music to plug yourself into the vibrations of the planet. Harmonize your inner vibration with the vibration of the audience. The human beings vibrating in harmony together. It's like a pagan. It's like some sort of mystical Christ. The release of the Kundalini, the Kundalini power expanding in your body and curling and coiling upwards. The Aquarian age in which we'll finally begin to merge all the religions and sciences and arts and whatnots, and we will realize that we are gods. Jim Morrison was a god unto himself. I'm a god unto myself. We are all gods unto ourselves. So put it outside of yourself. Mm. To put it outside of yourself is seeking a false messiah. That's Masonic. That's the end of the 2,000 years of culture and the religion we are involved in now. So, yeah, they're getting rid of 2,000 years of Christianity to start a new hmm. kind of world. Then. Okay, yeah, to bring it into that, what people, some people would say the music industry in particular, it has, is really moving that forward even more, that idea. Um, yeah. with some of the things they do. I mean, you could do a whole show on uh, what goes on at the Grammy Awards with all this uh, talk of rituals and and some of the uh, musical uh, performances that are very ritualistic in theme. And, and so, you know, looks like the music industry has never stopped doing what Manzarek is, uh, has been saying there. Um, I would agree with that. I mean, they're all part of that same process, I think. What was that, Amy? It's a way for them to live forever. If you think about yeah. it, like Aleister Crowley just wanted to like, he wanted to create this religion that would oh, yeah. last. Forever. And so that he, he, it, he doesn't have to die, you know? And it's like, yeah, all this, all these musicians, like they're, they're essentially doing the same thing because we're still listening mm -hmm. to them. So. Yeah. True. yeah. yeah oh, pop culture became this yeah this different thing in the 60s than it had ever been before in this country you know right and by extension the west well i mean plus at that time that you know with a song like the end right and one of walter and my favorite movies and one day we'll do a, a video that's an analysis of apocalypse now the opening yeah. scene is the end and then yeah. at the end the closing scene when Willard is, you know, I won't spoil anything. The end plays again, right where it leaves off at, from the beginning of the film. Yeah. Yeah. And well, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I okay. interrupted you. To me, that song, what the song represents is mm -hmm. the end of our innocence. It's the end of America's innocence because the Vietnam, uh, the Vietnam war, like what William was talking about, it, it just, it, it, you know, there was no reason for us to be involved with that war at all. At all. And it's not like World War II where we had a, a um, you know, Pearl Harbor. Yeah. yeah. Right. We had, they had to make up something for us to go to war. Well, and let's not forget Korea. Korea was really the first war we had where our military industrial complex was calling the shots. Um, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. That was where they, I think they tested the model that they used in Vietnam in Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and Did this whole idea, the police, the policemen of the world crap. Yeah. You know, so, um, so let's get into um, what, uh, and, and I know William, you, you have a lot of this info. The, the evidence for the doors and Jim Morrison um, being, you know, using these satanic themes and in really presenting and pushing satanic themes and being into this stuff. What uh, what is out there that that um, you know demonstrates that illuminates that for us? 
Well, he, I mean, he supposedly met Satan in Venice. Do you ever hear that story? Like no. He, on the, on the, yeah, he said that. Uh, he says, I left school and went down to the beach to live. I slept on a roof. At night, the moon became a woman's face. I met the spirit of music and appearance of the devil on a Venice canal running. I saw Satan or Seder moving beside me, a fleshy shadow of my secret mind. So I saw some kind of phantasm or something. That was I like wonder how movie. I wonder how drunk or high he was when he saw <laughs> that. <laughs> Who knows? Probably high. I don't know if he ever was not drunk. He was a total day drinker too. But yeah, uh, he was. He was. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was it. He was just dark sided. He was interested in that kind of dark sided stuff. How much of his occultism, where he learned it from, I'm just not aware of that. I'd have to go mm -hmm. back and read a lot more of his. Right. kind of biographies and things like that but I, yeah because i, I, I okay. sorry go ahead no no go ahead uh, i was i kind of wonder how much he learned from his from patricia true good point good point and um you know the fact that he was a voracious reader um and it, it, you know on on the on the other hand with all this stuff it could be that because he was um a curious intellectual type and because of the times where everything was you know uh, careening into a social chaos and um you know everybody was exploring to find themselves and perhaps because as you said he's dark-sided um in, in kind of a byron-esque way of course um you know i wonder how much of this was affect you know, an effect of his intellectual stimulations. So he was expressing these kinds of things and that's as far as it went, you know, but the story about the, um, the drinking of blood, that, that, that's a little bit farther than just uh, poetic meanderings. Uh, indeed. Um, is there anything that, else? There's other pictures of him. I sent some of them to Todd where he's like doing, the classic kind of Hollywood one eye themes, and he yeah, would okay. bring a uh, oh wow goat on the stage. I'll send those to you, Walter. I'm sorry I didn't. I okay. Sheep. He would send. He would have like the death's head hat. Um, wow. He seemed to know. Like somebody uh, said that maybe his beard was like associated with the process, so he might have been close to them. The process was at in Venice at the time, is my understanding. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, Peace Frog says that blood on the streets in the town of New Haven, blood stains the roots in the palm trees of Venice. So, right, he like uh, pops like two American cult cities with right. stolen bones. Let, let, let me just add something too. Uh, according to Maury Terry's book, um, The Ultimate Evil, the informant told Maury that Manson the Second was living in Venice. Wow. The person who orchestrated the murder of Arliss Perry, which we, you know, we talked about last time when uh, William was on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there was a su suspicious death that was tied to Manson and the family that was never really confirmed, but it was a strange death of a guy by the mm -hmm. name of Haupt, H A U P T, in Venice. And they just, you know, it's like one of those mysterious deaths that was around the Manson family, much like. Yeah. Okay their lawyer who died in a river, like a smiley face killings death, like mysteriously mm. shows up in a river. So uh, Venice was a strange place back then. It's much different now. It's gentrified, but uh, yeah. what do we, um, what do we know about Manzarek, Dinsmore and Krieger's pasts? That's, That's a good, good question. question. I don't know much about it. I don't know much about them. And, and I'm trying to remember what um, at least McGowan said. I, I think Manzarek has passed away, and I believe Krieger and Densmore are still around. Yeah. I know Manzarek was a huge fan of UCLA basketball because he was <laughs> in a documentary about the you know they had the UCLA had that streak, right, uh, in the sixties and seventies where they're just winning championship after championship. Now, but but were their parents either one of their parents their fathers uh, military guys at all? Did that would know? not surprise me one bit if they were. I I don't know. Uh, off the top of my head, William, do you know that they were in the military? He's the uh, Baron Zarek. It says here, according to his Wikipedia, he, he's born in Chicago, Illinois, to, to Polish parents. 
So okay. they don't seem to have any. Hmm. He actually was briefly enrolled at UCLA School of Law. Ah, interesting. Well, uh, and well, you you probably know this. Um, there are spooks around the uh, legal profession, oh, so that's interesting. Right. He might have been recruited. They're recruited exactly, out right? Yeah. Spotted, yeah. So there we go. I mean, that could be. Now, here's the interesting thing: if you looked into his parents, okay, from Poland, um, is what that seems to say. Uh, if if they had come over during either World War II or the early years of the Cold War, um, they might have been uh, sources to some degree of the intelligence community, which would then have put their son on the scope for the spooks, you know, who, who could have. Folks, this is all, you know, speculation right here, but with the circumstances, you know, we're trying to figure this out. Um, yeah, that, that's the fact that you said it, it, his parents were from Poland and he went to law school at one time, uh, at, at one time, um, I see spooks possibly in his life before the doors. So that kind of, uh, lens to what we're talking about here. And of course, Krieger and Dinsmore wouldn't have to have had a connection like that. It, you know, if um, Morrison and Manzarek were the ones who were directly spook connected, that would have been enough, you know. Right, right. Uh, Amy, uh, uh, what was I going to ask you? Um, like, what would you tell us about, like, the death of Jim Morrison? Mm hmm. And I like mean, I, that, yeah, that, that the thing it has in common, maybe that the, the, the ship evolved in the. He Go died the same the same time that his um that his dad um I don't know. He gave he, his dad gave the keynote speech. speech. Yeah. He gave a speech about the, the Vietnam War or something like that. I don't You got your notes? That's your... <laughs> I got my notes too. He um, basically gave the speech the same day that Jim Morrison died. They retired the boat that was involved oh, in the wow. Golden Tonkin incident. Yeah, allegedly involved, right? <laughs> right, right, right. There That's was all right. kinds of strange stuff going on during that time. USS Liberty, all the assassinations. It's really incredible. The sixties probably was probably influenced the music because there was so much murder and death and assassinations and mind control oh, sure. and things like that. So yeah, it's probably why there was so many so much high strangeness in all these bands. And I mean, some of those guys were really elites. I think Crosby is really a Van Cortland, which is uh, mm -hmm. an old kind of East Coast wasp family. And there, there's actually a park in the boroughs of New York City called Van Cortland Park where there was a you know, some process connections or I think one of these yeah. teachers or something was taken there and murdered ritually or something right, like right. that. Right, right. And uh, the, that's that's close to Untemeyer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's just south. It's called Van Cortland Park. Yeah, that's Crosby. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Amy might know something about this. Um, I, I'm I, now I saw this emerge two days ago, which was April first. But the story going around social media about um, Morrison's alive—he was found alive—and there's a lot of people I think that aren't realizing that that story was likely um, from what from what I'm gathering an April Fool's joke. But I do recall that um, uh, you know there there is the the historical poet Rambeau who faked his own death. And, um, you know, so stories of Morrison faking his own death have been around for a long time. If I'm not mistaken, the film Eddie and the Cruisers was inspired by the Morrison story. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen that movie, oh, well, it's from the 80s. So spoiler alert. Pretty um, good. It is. It's a, it's a good film. But, you know, what... Uh, Oh, Amy, have you heard anything that um, could be taken seriously or, or considered about maybe Morrison, you know, is alive or didn't die when they said he did? I mean, maybe they put him in witness protection or something. I mean, I don't know. Like, people would believe anybody would, like, anybody that has some sort of alcohol or drug problem, it's really mm -hmm. easy for people to believe that they would overdose. Um, yeah. So... You know, and it's the same thing. I'm a huge fan of Tupac. 
And so when mm -hmm. they took him out, you know, he spoke out about the media. He spoke out about what they were actually doing with the black race, trying to like manipulate them and thinking that it was like, you know, white people that were, you mm -hmm. know, out, out to get them all the time. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. that's what, that's what they do. And that like, they, they can, they control, like if anybody has talent, they just use them until they don't need them anymore. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Well, I, so, I, I like, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, but I mean, I was going to ask like how many doors albums there were like three. I don't yeah, think that many. Career. Like that's a pretty short lived musical career. Yeah. Um, and no doubt. well, what I like what you said about witness protection, where my mind was going is that um, if Morrison had intelligence agent, see connections um you know they can they can pull off and provide the best witness protection program mm -hmm. of anyone and it would have been very easy for them to pull that off with him so i've never had i've never dismissed out of hand the idea that morrison faked his death i i think it would be like him because i i think him going to paris to begin with wasn't that kind of a Ah, screw it! I'm going to Paris. It, it, you know, he he was. It was just like his his time on the scene was done. So off he went to yeah. Paris. The mission has ended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They so. made six albums while Morrison was supposedly still alive, from '67 oh. to '71. It was six oh. albums oh. according to the Wikipedia. Yeah. I don't know why I thought it was three. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had his like little heyday. And then once mm -hmm. that was over, it's like, okay, we don't need you anymore. Bye-bye. Right. You know? Right. And, and then he goes to Paris and then they decide, you know, okay, we're going to fake your death. You can go live on the island with Elvis and Tupac and, and, right. <laughs> and all of them, right? Yeah. Join the 27 Club. and go <laughs> The 27 Club. There you go. Right, right. Yeah. And well, they just recently, uh, didn't they, they recently arrested the guy who claimed to have killed Tupac. Oh yes. yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Right. You know, going and, back, going back to the photo of Morrison. You know, it's supposed to be on the Bonham Richard, which was yeah. named after uh, John Paul Jones' famous ship, um, the "I've Not Yet Begun to Fight Battle" off of Flamborough Head. Great story. I got to do a show on that. Anyway, here's what's interesting: Morrison goes to Paris where he allegedly dies. Um, a lot of Americans don't know this, but John Paul Jones had uh, retired to Paris and mm -hmm. died there. And uh, he was destitute, but somebody there in Paris thought enough to bury him or, or to encase him in a lead box filled with alcohol because they assumed, you know what? The United States is gonna want his remains someday. And there those remains sat, okay? until uh, uh, in a basement of a Paris house until Teddy Roosevelt was president and Charles Bonaparte, the American born grand nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte was secretary of the Navy. And they brought with great fanfare, the remains of John Paul Jones back to America. And of course, interred him where he is now at the U S Naval Academy in a beautiful crypt. Um, wow. That's but, amazing. That's a great story. Right. And it's interesting that, you know, Morrison, his dad was Navy. He's on the Bonhomme Richard. And then he goes to Paris to die. I, you know, uh, he's poetic enough that I wonder if he was a, uh, a fan, his, you know, of John Paul Jones, the Naval officer. Wasn't anyway. John Paul Jones famous for raiding the UK? Like he would take his boat oh, and raid, raid he, he the, was you know, a master. He would America. raid the coast of England yeah. and um, they caught him. Uh, off of Scotland, off of what's called Flamborough Head, which is an entry into one of the uh, rivers or whatever. And uh, uh, his escort took off scared. So he was left alone, uh, he and his crew, with the Bonham Richard to uh, face the British. And the Serapis came at him, and they famously um, were going at it with the broadsides. And the Bonham Richard was being obliterated and was beginning to sink. And uh, the British captain called out, said, hey, do you want to strike your colors and surrender? And that's when Jones did his famous line, strike my colors, I'll be damned. I've not yet begun to fight. And then he orders his crew to get out the grappling hooks. And they, they use the lines to bring the sinking Bonham Richard right tight up against the Serapis. He breaks out the sabers and the pistols. His crew goes onto the Serapis. 
beats the ass of the British crew and they capture the Serapis. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the most that's beautiful good. stories in American history. It's just, I love that kind of bravado. And that that's the famous, I've not yet begun to fight, you know, the, the whole story. But yeah, he was quite an interesting uh Quite, quite an interesting guy. Anyway, that was a huge digression. Sorry about that. Let's get back to um, Morrison, story. the Doors, and and you know their involvement with Satanism and Crowleyism. Right, right. Um, what was I going to say? They, they, you know, the interesting thing about just about the Laurel Canyon scene in general is it seemed like a lot of them were kind of into the whole Crowleyism thing. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're because of the, the personal the freedom. The apology and all that. of Alistair yeah. Crowley, yeah. you know? Yeah, sex and uh, drugs and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. It, it was all about the... They certainly, part of a PSYOP or not, uh, they all certainly enjoyed the fruits of that kind of personal freedom. Um, you know, a lot of people in America were, uh, you know, for how many years before... They, of course, um, unleashed upon us the Manson family and consciously destroyed uh, in the summer of love the whole um, hippie meme, as it were, right? Right, so, right. Yeah, they put the kibosh on that moment. Desires. What's that, Amy? It exploits our carnal desires. Yeah. Yeah. The easiest thing to exploit in the human psyche, wouldn't you say? Are, are the, the is the carnality the the base desires that's the the easy way to um, go at someone uh, if you want to compromise freedom, freedom and yes. liberty yeah yeah it's all you know the the um, sexual revolution and and uh, all of that um, what year did Morrison go to Paris seventy or seventy one was it oh seventy I think he he supposedly died in 71, I think. Okay. Wow. July 3rd, 1971. July 3rd. Interesting choice. Yeah. Hmm. Just a day off. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, you know, that's that's kind of interesting. Um, I wonder when he left, what was the time frame between when he left and when he died? I guess he said he left in March and died in July. Left L.A. in March. So he wasn't in Paris very long when he died. Is that right? No, not very long. That sounds. I don't Three think he was ago. actually. Four months. If if memory serves, he he wasn't there. I, it had to be like it couldn't have been a year. It had to be something like three or four months, or like yeah, you I know. Think you're right. Yeah. Now, when did they? When was Manson captured? In the Manson Manson was captured. Had- Manson was captured in 69, August 8th. No, no, no. It was after that because Susan Atkins is the one who kind of su- uh, spilled the beans. They caught him in a, was it a cupboard? Or yeah, he a was cabinet? in a, a cabinet, a little cabinet. But yeah, but he, that, was, a, he, he was at the, uh, he's in uh, um, uh, that canyon uh, where the devil house uh, is. Cielo, Cielo Canyon? Oh, no, no, not Cielo. The Panga? Uh, yeah, that's the it. Panga? Panga. Okay. Yeah, um, the there's a, a lot of interesting UFO activity in Topanga over the years, too. That's kind of um, interesting. Now, when was the trial? The, the, For Manson? You know, the, yeah. The well, that took place all through 1970. All through the year 1970. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and Morrison leaves for Paris in spring of 71. Uh, I, I mean, one could say, well, that was the end of the the, the freedom-loving hippie era, you know, there in L.A., so why stick around? But then one could also say, like we said a moment ago, mission accomplished, you know, yeah. time to disperse. I wonder how many of the others that we've talked about, when did they start? leaving Laurel Canyon, like, like Zappa and, and Crosby and Stills and them. Right. It's a good well, question. I know Zappa went back to Washington because he had a, a pretty good little uh, career as a, like a political career. Um, oh, in the eighties. Yeah. When all that um, stuff about the, uh, 
the naughty lyrics and uh, you know mm -hmm. the um uh, tipper gore and all that that was was that late 80s or early 90s actually right I mean, now yeah. the funny thing about the early 90s the funny right. thing about zappa is like zappa hated the counterculture yeah he did he hated them he it's like anton LeBay. anton LeBay also hated the counterculture <laughs> Uh, he's yeah. so why would he do drugs because that yeah. would alter his state of mind he couldn't control anything right yeah he didn't like drugs he 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 yeah. would he would let yeah. them come to the he's the log that's cabin that's and party cool. and do all that but he wouldn't do it himself mm -hmm. well i think so. the reason why they they pushed all the drugs was so they could push the police state you know because shortly after that was the war on drugs yeah you know? that's true so. that's true which was never fought the way it should have been fought if they were really wanting to do something about it. And we know why, because the drug trade was part of, um, you know, if you, mm. is it Gary Webb? Was he the, the yeah. unfortunate guy? Yeah. You know, if you read his stuff, the, uh, the drug trade had always been how the CIA and the military industrial complex, you know, um, part of how they were doing business and that and actually goes back to phoenix and vietnam if i'm not mistaken right 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 yeah. yeah yeah golden triangle all that stuff yeah which yeah, actually the, goes uh, back to the british empire in china they're the ones right. who started the, opium uh, wars the, yeah the drug trade and all that you know so go, oh my friends the british. Like pot right now have you noticed that like what's that um they're legalizing marijuana like all over the country and like yeah a lot of people are going to mental institutions because they're using this government weed. <laughs> and oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, I, so you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, as a, my viewers know, I'm a air force officer, um, reserve inactive, uh, came off active duty years ago and a former federal agent. And, you know, I never smoked weed, never did any of that. Um, but since I went, uh, went through cancer treatment, I do, um, gummies every night. <laughs> It, you know, so I can that, sleep better. Like What's that? You like it? Do you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, I sleep all, I sleep straight through the night. And, uh, you know, my, my kid and, and her friends and my, you know, my, my son too, when he's out, um, you know, everybody laughs at me because when it hits, I go up, oh, here comes balloon head. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. Altered states. And um, it's probably so it, the, probably the healthiest it, sleeping aid you could take. Right, Probably. that's what like I understand. Your body should just, uh, it's part of the what do they call it? There's a certain system in your, like, uh, in mm -hmm. your it cancels out the REM cycle too. So, if you have PTSD that you know you have nightmares, it really helps with that, guys. I'll be right back. You guys speak amongst yourselves. Okay, yeah, but let's I think all it's hide. A good question There's a di different connection between Morrison, like, it's probably you have to go through his biographies. But I know he was hanging out with those guys in New York City. Uh -huh. It was the Andy Warhol. And there was like a whole yes. crew of really interesting. The Velvet Underground, right? Yeah. Mm. So that heroin chic was a big thing at that time. So he was part of that. They say that he died, his drug dealer died, and his girlfriend at the time. Not Keneally, but somebody else died all from heroin consumption. It was China White. It was like supposed wow. to be super pure. That's the argument if he died at all, but that's supposedly how he OD'd. But I think it's mm. the drug dealer they had at the time in Paris definitely OD'd on that. So there's a lot of other questions about Morrison. Maybe it's a whole other show, but like who's he? He's hanging out with the kind of uh, artistic, cognoscenti, whatever, you know, uh, glitterati type characters. So. I wonder where he learned his stuff. Like, who was who was imparting this stuff to him? Was it really? Yeah, uh, you know, I I wonder. Um, you know, he had kind of a, uh, from what I understand, not the best relationship with his parents, right? Because his dad, being a military officer, military he guy, said they were dead. he what? He said they were dead. Yeah, he like, said they were dead at one point, and <laughs> and his mom, from what I understand, he really did not like his mom. He thought of her. Oh, what's the thing about um, uh, you know the the issue with the incest? Pamela DeBars said that he liked to read up on that, and then there's the famous performance. I think it was in Madison Square Garden where his mother was present, and oh. he makes the comment. 
Um, Dad, I want to kill you. The the what is it? Oh, yeah. the, 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 the middle Medical part of the end. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Like the killer woke before dawn. He put his boots on. He chose a face from the ancient gallery and he walked on down the hall. First, he paid a visit to his brother. Then he paid a visit to his sister. And yeah, it's the classic Oedipus complex. Yeah, because he because yeah because he says yeah. you know mom or mother or something I want to I fuck wanna, you, you know yeah 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 and it was use their music to explain like things that happened to them as a kid right right yeah so yeah so you got to wonder what the heck was going on there I mean was it just because she was supposed to be such a ball buster you know to his dad that this this was a an angry way for him to you know, uh, lash out at her, maybe embarrass her, or was there really some, some Oedipal, uh, you know, incestuous thing going on in his head? Because remember, uh, again, he's a poet, certainly <clears throat> he was, um, into Byron. And, uh, we know that Byron had a thing for, what was it? A half sister, right? Byron I thought it was, was a cousin. Another. Was it a cousin? No, well, Edgar Allan Poe, I believe it was an underage cousin. Ah. Um, I think Byron, it was, maybe it was a cousin. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause you know what? I took that situation and applied it and that, that aspect um, into a novel I did where the main character um, ends up with his, with his half sister. And it was inspired by the Byron thing, which Byron, you're right. It was a cousin, which, mm -hmm. you know, um, doesn't seem as, pearl clutching to us in our times as it would have then. But then again, shouldn't it have them because people married their cousins all the time. So now I've come full circle. Why was that ever shocking that Byron was into his cousin? You know, you just don't want to, you don't want to be with your first cousin, right? <laughs> well, you in know, the state of California, cousin, maybe if it's like your 25th cousin, eight times removed or well, something. In the state of, in the state of California, Washington state, New York. I think there's about like seven or eight states. You can marry your first cousins. So you can marry them despite whatever potential blood medical issues there, there might yeah. come of that. Uh, and that's just setting aside the, you know, the weirdness of it. Most of us think of our first cousins as siblings, right? If yeah. we've uh, spent time around them, um, you know, uh, I think everywhere you can marry like a second, third and, you know, on cousin, but um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of weird to people, but not nearly as weird as the uh, Oedipus or the electric complex. Um, so, you know, I, I just, all of this makes me wonder, yeah, what, what went on in Morrison's childhood and in his young teens um, did all this stuff he was into merely come from his intellectual interests and in what he read or, you know, what the heck was in the mix here? And, um, to what extent did he talk about Crowley? Morrison? Yeah. I don't know. William? Like, I, I mean, I, I, um, I thought I was under the impression that that idol was Crowley until you said it wasn't like I, I read it from somewhere else. So. I'm pretty surprised. I don't know. Like I, I'd have to go back through and read through his stuff. I don't really have that long of a, a part of section on Morrison in my book. I have like three or four pages, but he's definitely an occultist blood drinker, which is very Crowley. And yeah, well, tell, think... tell us more, tell us more about your book that uh, well, maybe covers... things we haven't covered today. Well, I mean, I really, what I was doing is in children of the beast is tracing Crowley's impact on the 20th century. And it's, okay. his impact isn't merely cultural, it's political as well. So there's a lot yeah. of political figures and political events that have really strong Crowley connections, like 9-11. All the numerology of 9-11 can be oh, traced God, back yeah. to Crowley. 11, right. 93, 77, 175. Yeah, that stuff's mind-blowing. That really, wow. <laughs> also, like uh, L. Ron Hubbard. I mean, you've got all the Ian Fleming knew him and was in communication, right? The guy who did Bond. So his process birth, Church. Monte Carthe, Process Church, Scientology, the founder of the gay movement, Harry Hay. 
John Carradine was a member of the OTO, one of the, the, the father of the four Carradine brothers. That one blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, whoa, John Carradine, really? Now, you mentioned L. Ron Hubbard. Um, I'm curious about um, Elbert Hubbard, his uncle. Um, I have a couple of uh, books of his. Uh, he died on the Lusitania, which, wow. of course, to me, there's all sorts of weirdness you know, we're enough yeah. weirdness connected to the Lusitania. Highest, highest weirdness. Totally strange. It right? involves yeah. Crowley too. It involves Crowley. Crowley came oh, to the that's United right. States. Yeah. Crowley of came course. to the United States on the Lusitania. Yeah. Right. Um, disturbing. Um, now, is there anything you're aware of uh, where Elron is concerned that maybe Albert Hubbard might have been, might have given us clues to, uh, or, or was Albert just, not involved with anything that Ron... I didn't, I don't recall coming across Albert Hubbard. I wasn't aware with him, of him, but L. Ron Hubbard's son said that his father was definitely interested in Crowley and used to see him kind of going through his stuff in his speeches. Yeah. And some of the very early parts of Scientology, he's clearly referencing in recorded conversations. Uh, Alistair Crowley calls him the great beast, 666, mm -hmm. interesting guy, mm -hmm. magician. So uh, Hubbard was very aware of that and very aware, had to have been very aware because he was very associated, if not part of the Agape Lodge in Pasadena with uh, right. This know, is Mark just a little Lodge sample of uh, our next, uh, our, our the, the next thing we're doing. Oh, okay. So you guys are going to get into this on the next California or the next uh, the pre record. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, that'll be good. That'll be good. You guys are going to have to, you know wait until that's ready to to hear that stuff so yeah. um you know we'll uh we'll keep everyone apprised of how soon that's going to be available and um so is is there anything that um we didn't cover yet in for today that you guys wanted to william or amy wanted to wanted to talk about or bring up not me i know i, I... We're all covered. We should have okay. got those pictures together and put together a little slideshow. It would have been interesting. What what we can do is, um, Todd, you can send them to me, and yeah. um, we can we attach them in. somehow. Yeah. yeah. So, well, this is the point of the show where we go to the live chat and uh, take questions. If you guys, uh, you good for another half hour, William and sure, Amy? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty, folks. Um, remember, uh, all caps if you want us to acknowledge the comment or answer the question. All caps because there's a lot of side conversations that go on in live chats, and we want to know that you're addressing us. Any questions for the guests, Todd, Amy, or William, on Aleister Crowley and the music scene of the '60s, uh, Jim Morrison, The Doors. Um, uh, also. Uh before we get started on that, I like to remind sure. everybody to please hit the like button and subscribe. If you like what you're hearing here, hit that like and hit subscribe. Very important. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, if the Laurel Canyon music scene and all the the musical product that came out of that was part of a psyop. We have to ask ourselves, what the hell was disco? Oh yeah, <laughs> disco was pretty terrible. Sex, sex, sex. sex. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I think I. You know what? I think Amy hit the nail on the head. It doesn't mean that disco was not a psyop. In fact, disco very well could have been another psyop. I think that's well, what I. Disco was led in kind of half disco joking led in the house music. music. What's yeah right and that house music? Early. Oh boy. Trance, Those little right? drum beats that they would sample all came from disco. Yeah, okay. Johnny the music, Sides. The music. Go ahead, Amy. I'm sorry. Um, the music correlates with the political events of the time. You know, so oh, if yes. they're pushing like women's rights and everything, and they're pushing like homosexuality, and then you know the music is going to be the first thing to do that. You know, like what Todd was saying before, like politics sure. downstream from culture and so it, it makes perfect sense why all these political decisions like major political decisions occurred in the 70s after this whole you know the left took over the culture war which wasn't hard right. for them mm -hmm. not at all right right there's no right. pushback 
right? <laughs> uh, let me see. Ah, I hate when this just starts piling up here. Johnny Side says, I have read so, uh, so much on Jim Morrison, and I think this is a huge reach in regards to Jim Morrison and any Crowley connections. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, however, I think uh, um, the uh, particular set of verse um, that was quoted about the blood and the fingers and things like that, um, you know, circumstantial though it may be, uh, it, and the thing about the frog and all of that, you know, apparently we do find this in Crowley's writing. So there's a reference at, at the very least. It appears that Morrison did reference Crowley's right. writings. Uh, and and anybody so, who's a student of the occult, which it appears that Jim Morrison to some extent was, there's no way to avoid Crowley. If you're right, studying right. the occult, at some point you're going to hit right. that Crowley iceberg. Right, of course, of course. Yeah. But what we have to remember in, in all fairness is, you know, just like us three here, we are scholars and students, you know, as far as scholarly pursuits of some pretty dark, rotten things. It does not mean that we would condone those things or participate in them, mm -hmm. you know, uh, no matter right. what the artistic expression, just like the people who created the TV series Dexter, for example. I doubt any of them. I hope none of them are serial killers, but... I guess one yeah, would really. never know. Uh, Johnny Side again, the rest of the Laurel Canyon crew with MK Ultra. Yes, read the Laurel Canyon book. Okay. Yeah, the, I, I want to add to that. I totally um, am on board with um, there was some type of military industrial complex intelligence community connection to all these people. I mean, yeah, I agree. You don't have that many people being, you know, having fathers who are in that business and mm -hmm. just dismiss that you cannot you know right and, and, and just, just the machine that was behind the music the, the way that they like instantly like be promoted in right. magazines they'd instantly go on johnny carson or or yeah. and, you know uh, american bandstand or whatever you well know, and th think, it takes, think it of ever for an actual band to like get started Right. And, and think of that, that movie studio, that secret movie studio that several stars had been called in to make movies that were produced by the U.S. government, which the public to this day has never seen. And that right. facility was right there, you know, in right. that area. So if movies, why not music, you know? Right. And then remember, we were talking about the Air Force and MK Ultra. That was an yes. Air Force base. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. 5DRG asks, wasn't Jim Morrison supposed to have said he had murdered someone? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, William or... Uh, no, Amy, I don't know that. Know? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Uh, Jay Grinder, Disco, was selling cocaine. Yeah, I, that yeah, that was a part of it. Yeah. Absolutely. I would, uh, I would agree there. Um, Rodney Stubbard asked, does anyone know anything about Denny Doherty of the Mamas and the Papas? Um is that I know a lot about by... Mama Cass, and I know a lot about John Phillips. I don't know as much about uh, Donnie Doherty as, as uh, you know, I should. Yeah. Um, one project says all music is psyop. There's wisdom in that. Yes. <laughs> uh, Johnny Sy, fair. Walter Morrison is a hero of mine, and I like Crowley, so I may be biased. Yeah, I'm. I I hear you. Um, At least you can I'm, admit it. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Hey, we, we can all disagree. And there's nothing wrong with us disagreeing or anything like that. We're just people with opinions. You're nowhere near you as know? bad as Zappa fans. Zappa fans won't even when they wouldn't even listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> um uh I'm looking forward to reading William's book, Child of the Beast, because I I, I do need to um you know learn what I don't know about Crowley so that I can, you know. As always, like you said, we all decide for ourselves. Yeah. Um, so uh, his ideas are seeded all through our culture. Alan Moore, David Bowie, Ozzy Osbourne. James oh yeah, Moore, absolutely. Of, so. That is true. That is true. Rodney Stubbert says, "I've read a ton about Morrison too. I think it's a reach." Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, D. E. Sacone, who in that same era did not die, but you feel were heavily influenced by Crowley. 
Anyone else that you would point to? Jimmy Page, yeah. right? Yeah, Page, the Zeppelin. He oh, actually wait. collected all that stuff. And actually, it's he's connected to Crowley's connected through to the Manson family through Kenneth Anger. Yeah. Who lived with Bobby Buzala. So it's actually hard to believe. But Anger is a huge Crowley fan and yeah. former friends and now en or then enemies with Jimmy Page. But mm. uh, there's references to Marilyn M Manson. Uh, there's references to like artists like Alejandro Jodorowsky, the Beatles. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a kind of a lesser guy, a guy who did well on Anger's thing, um, which is called uh, Lucifer Rising. There's a guy, Daniel, Donald Camel, is in that who literally sat on Crowley's knee. He was literally a uh, wow, a son of a friend of Crowley. And Crowley okay. used to write him astrological things. His name's Donald Camel. I don't know if you've seen. The film performance totally like satanic film oh no 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 i have to yeah I no have to check that out seeds through all all you know leary of course timothy leary who thought he was carrying on crowley's work um, you know now um now that you mentioned yodorowsky now i have to wonder what his version of dune would be like that's the thing right now is to talk about right, yodorowsky's right. dune um so you know with these kind of influences i wonder what he would have done with herbert's material yeah, i don't think he would have been true to the book which i think no. is unfortunate like he was already kind of kind of scheming and stuff it would have been very strange and maybe interesting like some of his other works but yeah. i'm not sure he would have been true to what herbert's yeah kind of uh, <coughs> lookout mountain of course is what we were talking about i believe with the um that's right well lookout mountain is now owned by jared leto oh that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so cool. yeah yeah and a really terrible band. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, D -E I hear he's Mark. an asshole too. This friend of mine, she's like obsessed with him. Right? She waited outside of his concert. He wouldn't even talk to her. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, he's probably the arrogant artiste, right? Yeah. So yeah. let's keep going down here. Uh, one project says Satanists can change. Well, yes, of course, anyone can change. Uh, mm -hmm. Before sure. they die, right? Yeah. Jodorowsky's Dune is called the Incal. The Incal, or the, it's a graphic okay. novel. Okay. The second, this is not in all caps, but I find that interesting. John Lennon produced Jodorowsky movie. Don't think he was Thelonite. I don't know. Was were. were you know, I know there's the reference to Crowley on their album cover and stuff, but what what was the influence of Crowley on the Beatles and specifically John Lennon? Well, they thought they were kind of carrying on the magical tradition. And he said in one of his last interviews, John Lennon did, I think it was with Playboy, where he said, what the Beatles were about is doing what you want. And that's kind of Crowley's dictum, which is doing mm. Wilf. So he kind of, Damn. I think he intentionally aped that. And... He was also John Lennon. That, uh, was a very much had an acrimonious uh, outlook towards institutional Christianity, which Crowley would have shared. So I think they were both. Although, uh, okay, I, think, I, I don't hold that against them. He said we're bigger than Jesus Christ, and he was kind of a yeah. uh, Lennon was kind of a pest to kind of American Christianity, is my understanding. A lot of the pastors didn't like him uh, being around, but. You know, I think that he was a much nicer, Lennon was a much uh, more kind and gentle guy than Crowley was. For sure. Yeah, they say that there were people that were close to Lennon in the last five or so, 10 years or whatever of his life, who um, I remember about t uh, 10 or 12 years ago when a, a re the biography had come out about Lennon, um, it kind of um, made some, you know, folks uh, of a political leaning clutch their pearls because the sources said that as Lenin got older, he became more conservative. Now, yeah. not a flag waving Republican, but he liked Ronald Reagan, for example, is what these people said. And um, he, he became more conservative as he got older. So I, that, that one, you know, for a lot of people was out of left field when you're talking about John Lennon. Yeah, but, that's um, pretty strange. Yeah, I don't hold it against anyone that has a trouble with institutional Christianity. I I have trouble. I don't either. So, <laughs> so it's like, hey, man. Thing. 
I'm just saying that's a feather in his cap, you know. Um, are there Nathan Etzelas? Are there any real Crowley connections to the Bush family? Well, there's that famous claim that uh, he was uh, Barbara Bush's father because of Cephalu and her mother and all that. Does anyone know more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it was uh, Pauline Pierce is is Barbara Pierce slash Bush's mother who was known to be in France. She was a uh, uh, kind of like an elite scion here where in, back in the time in the 20s with wealthy people who had money they would go to paris paris was not the yeah. dump 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 that it is today it was actually like the city of lights and that was a real attraction for wealthy people artists etc mm -hmm. and so she had a friend who was o'hara and there was another guy harris and then harris was definitely good friends with crowley so it's rumored and alleged that Crowley was doing rituals at that time, and the offspring of Pauline, who doesn't really look like her other kids, is Barbara right. Bush. And the timing right. is kind of right. Her head's the same. Crowley the timing's right. Big, yeah. They resent, you know, head, the genetics. The, yeah, the, the resemblance, um, you know, of the features, the eyes, nose, and mouth. Uh, I, I, mm, it, I mean, her relationship you know, with Bush, it seems like an arranged marriage of right. two wealthy families, two kind of. Uh, elite families and then you can just lead up to the sun to 9-11 which is just a full-on magical yeah. working in the yeah. public oh yeah we're, we're talking about this uh amy and i were actually talking about this on the phones it's like uh, you're telling me about like bush going on and declaring it a new world order on at 9-11 uh, right, was that uh, 1991? 1990 11 so it's years. 11 years it's yeah. 11 years to the date of september 11th 2020 wow well. wow Wow. Wow. Yeah, Johnny no, Side like, says it's either just one of the strangest uh coincidences in human history or they had it all plotted out. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking on plotted, those lines. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna and do I haven't big, I haven't personally millennium. believed in coincidences in a long time. So right. you know. Uh Johnny Side says Lenin was assassinated by an MK Ultra victim who, you know, yeah. Uh, exactly. Well, There's the connections. I would together. say he was an MK Ultra Patsy. I don't think that actually Chapman mm. shot him. Somebody else there was an assassin who came in. If you, I mean, if you, there's a book that just came out called Mind Games. Yeah. And they got okay. the autopsy report and the target, the shooting of Lennon was what an assassin would do, which was at a tight spot on the left side of his chest where the blood comes out of the heart. So. Yeah. It's like, or goes in at one or the other. I forgot which one, but it basically would render your whole circulatory system, you know, gone. So what, what was, what was the caliber? I don't remember offhand. I don't remember. I, I wonder if it was a small but the, caliber. The, the, the story the... that Chapman went into the Dakota and shot him in that kind of entryway was all fake. It's not the real right. story because somehow uh, Lennon's body got inside this kind of causeway that goes up the stairs to kind of like where the guard would be because there's a blood stain there and then mm -hmm. he came out so there was something else going on and chapman was hanging around the dakota this is a, a, a fact hanging around the dakota for months like he would hang out there and then leave so it was almost like they were just getting him into place and uh so i think he was a yeah. mind control patsy not yeah. the actual killer much like sir ah. Sir they couldn't leave yeah, it to I would... They couldn't leave it to choice and somebody who wasn't that trained. They just had to right. make sure that somebody thought and they thought they did it because they don't. Yeah, really that makes operational sense, you know, and I was thinking of the uh, um, Amy, we stepped on you. Uh, you were saying something about, uh, I think, Lennon and Crowley or. Oh, I don't even remember. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry <about that. laughs> I mean, they, they were bringing the people together. They were. Bring, yeah, they I mean, he like in his solo career, you know, he, he clearly, what you were saying earlier about how he switched directions, but maybe he wasn't ever really in that direction. Or maybe he like during his solo career, it seems like during a lot of musicians solo career, they change like a lot of what they supposedly represented, you know, when, when they were being controlled in a band or whatever, then it's like their true feelings come out and then um, they get rid of them. Because they they realize oh shit they're they're not easy to control and they're trying to do like the exact opposite of what we want 
so you know he was he was trying to say like you know like we shouldn't be relying on the government we should be relying on the people you know right. and so right you know, yeah, that's no a problem. major threat especially when like a, a major lot of that music stuff like the, the beatles went from kind of lovey-dovey music to, to a very dark area and then broke off, broke mm -hmm. off. Yeah, right and lennon comes on and starts singing anti-war songs and war mm -hmm. like crit critic of the culture like working class hero is a brilliant song man I yeah the class hero uh yeah which is a lot of truth you know uh mm -hmm. so i think you could they could see why people would would think that this guy's too independent and mm -hmm. It's just yeah, like the it's... intro to Parallax Views where, hey, I'm a politician. They say I'm independent, too independent for my own good. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Bang, bang. <laughs> That's an interesting movie, folks, if you haven't seen the Parallax View. Um, but it baby. ties into all these other, like Chapman. Lennon. Yes, it does. I think it actually hints at it. I think Parallax View was made before the Chapman event. Do you, any of you, this is for all three of you, do you um, think that the um, the reemergence of the Doors' popularity was merely uh, driven by the film, or or just the nostalgia because that generation was then you know they had re they they were coming into their you know upper middle age and retirement? Do you think it was just nostalgia driven, or do you think that um, maybe they wanted to reinvigorate any of the um, social influence? Um, I think a little bit of yeah. both. Because mm -hmm. it was yeah. the years leading up to 9-11, which William was just, right. you know, pointing around, out. But, uh, around that same time, the Beatles released uh, Free as a Bird, too, which is like the first sort of, uh, I, I guess it's sort of the first uh, put your foot in the water type of thing with like AI, right? Because okay. it had sort of Lennon's li lyrics in there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they they kind of placed his vocals in there and everything like that. It's it's sort of a really interesting song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I it's I a, think I have released once. in like the, the very like ninety nine two thousand that sort of area. Well, I could see where nostalgia could be a psyop weapon. Um, yeah. If you want to, if you want to um, uh, freeze up people's <laughs> uh, ability to think clearly and act. Um, uh, you know, on a political motivation or, or you know, show any kind of resistance, um, entrap them and snare them in nostalgia so that they they calm down and, and they get wrapped up for a time and, oh, remember when, remember when, so that they don't focus too much on what's going on in the here and now. And right. um, That's what they're doing I, now I, on social media. That's like all they're doing. I've noticed that. Right? People are just whining about it's not as good as it used to be. And I'm like, dude, in a way. And every generation says that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, they came out with a Woodstock movie recently. I don't know if y'all remember that. That yeah. was like a couple years ago. And yeah. I remember my parents talking. My parents are boomers. So they, you know, they were, they couldn't stop talking about it. I was like, yeah, they're trapping you. They, they'll never see it, but yeah, they'll never see they're being trapped. But <laughs> right. Eugene um, Levy was in that movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Huh. Well, Interesting yeah. that um, in the film, the great film, the 1971 Omega Man with Charlton Heston, great B film, of course, um, uh, the movie, it's it's kind of a, uh, it, it's a post-pandemic, right, dystopian story. And the movie that he goes to the movie theater to screen and watch over and over again is the original film about Woodstock. And, yeah. you know, think of the message of that. Here we have a story. It's just 1971 when this movie comes out. And I think it's further emphasizing the killing of the hippie love era because you're fine. You know, you're showing post Manson, you're showing this uh, post pandemic. Uh, people have been wiped out dystopian film and the movie he's watching, the fact that they juxtapose that with showing Woodstock, I think the unspoken message there is see, see where it led to. It led to dystopia and everybody dying. Right, right. I, I think that's the subconscious message of Woodstock being the film that he watches in the Omega right. Man. 
just well just it, it, that, that's really interesting you know the whole thing with the hippie movement and like woodstock and all that there's a real dark side to the hippie movement right it's this idea and it goes back to crowley right freedom mm -hmm. the whole idea of yeah. total freedom and you, mm -hmm. you start like the hippies started feeling entitled that like we need to be here we shouldn't have to pay for this right any goods and right. services we shouldn't have to pay for and like I remember, there was around nineteen uh, up there seventy four, I want to say, uh, in London there was a festival that was sort of Woodstock as had a lot of bands from that era. It got really freaking violent. Like you really got to see like the dark side of hippiedom. Like it was on display because like, it all was captured on tape. Human nature, you know. Yeah. Anytime you get that many people together, you know. Um, Human nurture. Ah, yeah. I'm sorry. Tree. I'm sorry, I had to interject. <laughs> I like that. I like that. But yeah, you know, you get you you get a bunch of people together, and you get them, you know, loosening up with, uh, you know, uh, with music and in either alcohol or drugs. You're gonna you're gonna have you know people running into each other, you know, and um, some bad things happening. Uh, Oregon music fan points out that, you know, Altamont, of course, the final yeah. nail in the coffin. Right. And, yeah. uh, and I, I, I think we're going to probably end up doing a show on Altamont because there's some really interesting stuff with Altamont. Ah, okay. Lot, okay. Leary, uh, Melvin Belli, the Rolling Stones. There's a yep. Lot there. yep. Yep. Well, folks, we're here at the hour and a half point, And that's usually where we, uh, bring this to an end and uh, for the, for the episode. And um, I want to thank uh, Amy and William for joining Todd and I um, this episode. And uh, I, I think this was one of the more interesting discussions we've ever had on this channel. Yeah. And um, we've just started really, I can see us um, revisiting this topic um, or facets of it again. So I hope yeah. you guys would be willing to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And uh, I mean, this felt like a really smooth conversation. And I, I just want to remind everybody, you know, you may not agree with us about the like Jim Morrison and, and Alistair Crowley and stuff. It's okay to disagree. It's yeah. all, you know, it's all right. It's, it, there's no stigma. We are not, uh, above you in any way or anything like that. This is just a fun discussion. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, myself, I'm still in the process of, um, the extent to which I studied Crowley was for my empire of the wheel books. That's what initially had me look at Crowley. And within the context of what I was writing about there, I found nothing to the extent that I had to look at Crowley. I found nothing to convince me of a lot of these dark, awful things that I often hear about him. And, and Todd knows that William knows that, but um, my thing is I can't wait to read William's book, child of the beast. And, you know, because there might be s some things I'm just not aware of that convince me otherwise, you know, I'm kind of ambivalent about Crowley. Um, yeah, he, he could be kind of a weird guy and there's things he did and was into that I have no interest in, but, um, you know, so just to further emphasize what, what Todd was saying is, you know, between us here, we have differences, um, you know, a spectrum of opinion on, on him. And with Morrison, you know, I see, uh, I see Morrison as a guy who, you know, was, um, you know, the voracious reader, a scholar, uh, you know, kind of expressing himself like young people do in, in sometimes an awkward, sometimes very embarrassing, um, negative ways. Um, I, I don't see him as an occultist per se, but then again, I'm not as familiar with all the data yet as you guys are. So again, Todd, thanks for bringing that up because we hear you know, even though we don't agree on the degree of everything, um, we have the discussion and that's what, you know, that's what this is about. So, and, and someone said in the comments, despite all this, I mean, I still listen to my doors greatest hits. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's great. You know, it's I, still music. Listen, I still listen to the grateful dead. Mm -hmm. 
right? You know, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, I mean, they make good music. It it's good matter. music. Ripple's fantastic. It doesn't matter if they yeah. were like worshiping Satan. Like you can still enjoy the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there we go. So anyway, I want to thank everybody in the in the live chat. Of course, the, you know, you guys are great. I want to thank everybody watching. Um, and if if there were any newbies out there, please, you know, uh, like you, and subscribe. Yeah, like and subscribe, and keep coming back. And um, we will. Uh, We'll all see you next month with another great episode of California. So, bye. -bye. Thanks.